It's time to take a ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive with our co-hosts, Alan Saunders and Zachary Smith. Welcome back to an episode of Steelers Afternoon Drive. I'm Zachary Smith. That is Alan Saunders. If you guys are watching on YouTube, as you can see, we got somebody riding in the passenger seat with us today. I'm in the back. Alan's driving. We got somebody riding shotgun. Alan, I'll let you do the honors of introducing today's guest. Yeah, welcome to the show. Christian Cable of On Mont Lake. He covers the University of Washington. Uh, and we're going to talk about Troy Fautano, the Steelers' first round draft pick and former Washington Husky. I wanted to, since then, get, you know, since the draft, get somebody in to talk about Troy. And uh, shout out to my good buddy, Lauren Kirschman, who now works at the University of Washington uh, for connecting us with Christian. Christian, thanks for joining us and uh, appreciate you have, coming along for the ride with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, okay, we know we want to talk about Troy, but let's get down to what we really want to talk about, Alan. First and foremost, Christian, what did you think of the intro? How good was that music? How good was, was Brandon Rossi's voice on that intro? That was very impressive. Um, as as the co-host of a podcast that's done 104 episodes now on a, a very lo-fi basis uh, without a formal introduction or anything, I always I see I see podcasts like yours that have the little video, and I think maybe we should do something like that. But I don't really know how. So we can hook you up with Brandon Rossi's contact information if that's our uh, that's our our voice in the sky there that that introduces us every day. He's a uh, he's a local PA announcer and a great dude. We've actually had him on the show before as well. So we we appreciate the uh, the 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 love there. We we're very proud of our of our introduction. The content is very questionable, but the intro <laughs> yeah. solid solid. <laughs> Yeah, Good thing that, first, we get man. people here. Now, can we get them to stay every time? <laughs> we get them here because of that. Uh, but yeah, let's talk about Troy a little bit. I, I want to know as much about the person as I do the player after this conversation. But we can start with the player first and foremost. From that perspective, your time covering him, what are the Steelers getting Troy Fatano? Yeah, I mean, I I would say a lot of the same things I'm sure you guys discussed and analyzed pre-draft, post-draft. Obviously, he's you start with the athleticism and the quickness, what he's able to do with his feet um, combined with, I think a really aggressive mentality. Um, I know when, when the last coaching staff got to Washington, Kalen DeBoer and, and offensive coordinator, Ryan Grubb, I think Grubb said that Fautanu was the most athletic offensive lineman he'd ever been around. And that it was at that point, just kind of about harnessing that and, you know, like any O-lineman getting him to 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 really attack every single play like he should dominate and he shouldn't ever lose a rep. Um, I know he played D-line in high school and I think kind of brings a little bit of a defensive mentality to the game just in terms of mm. I'm the aggressor, you know, you've you've got something I want, which is position across from me or whatever, and, and I'm going to do my job and I'm going to dominate. So um, he's – uh you wouldn't necessarily guess that he's uh this big mean football player just if you didn't know anything about him and met him and had a conversation with him he's he's pretty soft spoken and humble and and um didn't love doing interviews but was really good at it so he he had to do uh probably more than he, he would have liked but um yeah it was a, a a cool guy to talk to also obviously we've only gotten to talk to him once or twice but i think the thing that's interesting is you know i, I think as people that have been doing this a while, you kind of like to put people in boxes, right? Like you, you kind of like try to know what to expect. And you know, I don't, some guys are easy, right? Like, oh, you know, I, Steelers draft George Pickens. He's from Hoover, Alabama. He's from the University of Georgia. Like just knowing that, I think I have a pretty good idea of the person that, that, that you're, you're getting. And then like, Troy Fautano, he went to Washington. He's Samoan, but he's from Las Vegas. I'm like, what? what like what like how how do i get what what about his like background do you feel like kind of in, influence the person that he is and i don't know he seems like a guy that's hard to put him on those boxes what is he really like what 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 kind of interactions did you have with with the person yeah i mean he likes to talk about his teammates more than himself you know he's the he's the last guy who's gonna put himself on a pedestal and and say hey look at me but also you know, you kind of saw that whole O-line group at Washington take it a little bit personally going into the college football playoff last year. People were sort of talking about, well, they're passing offense. They're, they, they don't play big boy football. You know, they're not physical. They don't, they, they can't run the ball really like that. And I remember um, you, you could tell that didn't really sit well with him. Um, but he was very much a, 
just hey the game's gonna happen we're gonna play and we're, we're gonna show everybody so you know don't worry about it type of thing but i do remember him there's a video of him walking off the field after that game just say almost um almost kind of amused just saying like hey watch the tape watch the tape before you guys talk about us you know i look look what we just did so uh he he's um he's he's a very he has a very laid back demeanor off the field like i said i mean very friendly very approachable um i actually have this sort of when my daughter was really little and kind of just starting to walk they have their annual picture day at washington after one of their um preseason practices each year i thought hey it'd be a good way to just kind of get everybody out of the house and let her run around on the field and i have like a little two second video where he's waving at her at the end you know so mm-hmm. he, you could see he, he liked to interact with fans and um told us some funny stories about going out to eat with michael Penix and how michael Penix had to wear wear like to wear his mask when they went out in public so people wouldn't recognize him because they get he'd get swarmed if if he did and had a really good relationship with his o-line that way and those guys all got along so um yeah it was uh they they were they were a fun team to be around in terms of watching him play football but but also kind of um seeing the personality off the field too very early in the process here, Christian, but at rookie minicamp, they had him at right tackle. The Steelers did. That's where they had him starting out. You know, 6'3", sub 320. Uh, do you think that he can stick a tackle? Like, is he? Is it more about the footwork that he has, the, his hand placement? Like, is he so refined with his pass pro and his ability, the athleticism, that he's going to be able to stick a tackle despite the size maybe saying he should play guard? Yeah, I think the athleticism gives him a chance for sure. Um, and he sort of... That was sort of the talk coming out of the combine, right? Was that the the performance that he put on there maybe answered some of those questions where it felt like at least the narrative going in was he's probably a guard coming out of that. It seemed more realistic he was going to play tackle. You know, we in Seattle really only ever saw him play tackle extensively. He, mm-hmm. he started at guard um, the 2022 season, moved to tackle because Jackson Kirkland, their starting left tackle, had been hurt. Um, and it was so good there that even though Jackson Kirkland came back healthy and played, started a couple games at left tackle, they decided to just swap them and, and Fautanu played tackle from that point on. But, um, I, I do think he's athletic enough to do it. You know, I, maybe like you said, that, that lack of height and, and length eventually moves him inside. I think he could play guard too. I think the good thing with him is I think he has the attitude to do whatever you want. Right. I mean, he's not. I don't think he's somebody who's dead set on I'm a tackle or would be opposed to playing guard. Um, I think he just he, he's he's a football player. He's a lineman. He wants to he wants to play. He wants to win. Um, he'll he'll do whatever he needs to do. We were talking just uh, before we got on the air about you know, how incredible of a, of a last year it's been for Washington, and it seemed like, I mean, obviously. Anytime you have you know a bunch of good players like like Washington did, that they're all going to be a part of it. But how do you feel like he kind of played into the 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 you know a, a renaissance year for for the University of Washington and and as one of the veteran sort of established guys on that team, you know was was he kind of a, a flag carrier? Was he a, a a mindset leader for for the the squad? Yeah, I think so. Um, probably more of a lead by example guy, not necessarily rah rah. You know, give a, a a passionate locker room speech or anything like that. He was, you know, they won eleven games in twenty twenty two, and the assumption then was, well, this is going to be Penix's only year. Of course, he's going to go pro. They've got a handful of other guys like Romo Dunze, Fautanu was definitely on that list who would get drafted if they went out this year. Wouldn't necessarily be first, second, third round pick, but they'd, they'd get picked. And every single one of those guys came back to school. Now, there was, I think, a pretty significant NIL investment on, on Washington's end that that helped with that decision. But I remember talking to Troy Fautanu coming off that season, uh, and he he basically just said, hey, I, I can't imagine not being here for what's going to happen in 2023, that those guys – we're all committed to this vision that, you know, they talked openly about, they thought they could win a national championship. They thought they could contend for a national championship. So he was one of a a small handful, six to eight guys who they were really, really, really excited about bringing back and kind of sold a vision to of, Hey, if you come back, that increases the chances everyone else will come back. And if you guys all come back, this can really be a national championship roster next year. And so, I mean, they, you know, they, they knew from, 
I think the moment they got there before 2022, that he was a special athlete based on his performance throughout the 2022 season. Um, they felt strongly that, that he was going to be a centerpiece of what they were going to be offensively in 2023. And, and he was. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to know too, uh, you know, not the biggest rah-rah guy, like we're saying, kind of the flex, the praise to his teammates and stuff like that. Um, but like, what to you will be his, like, le- like, does he have a legacy in Washington? Is he kind of viewed as that type of player? Like how does the va- fan base and media view Troy Fatanu's time in Washington? Yeah. I mean, as, as much as an offensive lineman can, right. I mean, the headlines always, sure. always go to the quarterback and the receiver and, you know, Michael Penix Jr. and Romo Dunze were true superstars where mm-hmm. it's, it's not easy to be a, a superstar college football player um, to begin with. Right. Especially in an, in an NFL city. Uh, so those guys really broke through. And I think that that's kind of who people think of first, but yeah, I mean, Husky fans will remember Fautanu, you know, super fondly. Right, right. He was a he was a great player. There's some great highlight clips of him demolishing guys in in the running game and and that sort of thing. And he was also just known as a really good guy. Um, You know, he was one. I think Husky fans were were really pleased to see him get picked by his his favorite NFL team. Yeah. Right. And then everyone's seen the video of him sitting with his grandmothers. And, um, you know, that's that's who he is. He's he's that kind of guy. He's family first. He's he's quiet. He's humble. He goes about his business in a uh, not not necessarily the most flashy way. I think there's you know, it was it, it kind of became a, a, a pretty widely reported story out here that he worked out at the same still went and worked out at the same 24 hour fitness that he'd he'd <laughs> work out at, you know, even if if he'd already was all done with his football stuff at the facility for the day or whatever. I mean, he's just uh, he's a. Uh, He's a pretty humble guy, and and yeah, I think we'll, we'll be remembered fondly, just like a lot of guys in that 2023. Team. I mean, this this 2023 season at, at, at Washington, it got it got marred a little bit by Kalen DeBoer leaving for another job four days later. So people kind of felt like they didn't necessarily get to celebrate that team the, the way that they wanted, even though they did come up short of a national championship. But Husky fans um, are going to remember that as one of their most special seasons ever. And he was, you know, he's a two-time all-conference guy who's part of that. It had been pretty widely I guess, speculated that the Seahawks might be interested in drafting him. They had the 16th pick, decided to go with a defensive lineman, uh, Byron Murphy from Texas instead. Were you surprised that he was, uh, one, uh, got past Seattle, and two, you know, made it to the Steelers at 20? Uh, from what we've heard, the Steelers had him as a top 10 pick on their board were were you surprised that he fell as far as he did in the first round a little bit i was starting to feel like it it, referencing the seahawks at 16 i was starting to feel like it was more likely he'd he'd be off the board um before he got to them i wasn't surprised they went with byron murphy i mean the the draft broke incredibly well for them byron murphy's just sitting there i mean i i thought that was a a very obvious pick and and a good pick for them um i did see some reporting that the I think ESPN reported that the Seahawks had actually dropped him off their board as a first rounder uh, because of some injury concerns that was kept quiet. I, I don't think he ever missed any time due to injury at Washington. I, I thought of him as a pretty durable guy, but if, if there was something going on there, then, then, you know, maybe there was, but um, I wouldn't have guessed he'd last till, till 20 necessarily. I, I bet he's happy. He did. Uh, in, in retrospect, getting to go to getting to go to Pittsburgh and, and be part of that franchise and, and growing uh, what looks like a, a nice, young, developing offensive line there. But um, I, I was a little bit surprised. Yeah. Yeah, it is a young offensive line. And I think our expectation is anyway that he's going to be a day one starter. Uh, what do you think, uh, both in terms of the player and as the person that he is, about his ability to make that transition quickly. I mean, we've seen even really, really promising tackle prospects struggle as as rookies. What are your thoughts on him? Um, perhaps playing a large role in the NFL right away. Yeah, I I think he's as ready for it as you can be. I mean, it doesn't guarantee he's you know going to go out and have an awesome rookie season or or a terrible rookie season. But I just know, like talk, talking to him in interview settings and being around him a little bit. And this was true of really Washington's, you know, large chunk of their roster. They're too deep, especially last year. He's a he's a grown man. You know, he has a grown man mentality. It was his fifth year in college last year. He's very mature. Um, he he seems like a, a pretty realistic guy, not somebody who, you know, you're you're 
concerned about catching on mentally. Um, I think he's a pretty high IQ guy, you know, in terms of just the, the pressure and the next level, what's required of you at the next level mentally and, and all those things, the character of it. Um, I don't think any of that's a concern at all. Now got to go up there and, 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 and line up across from some NFL edge rushers and, and win your rep and, you know, who knows how that goes, but I, I think he's as prepared for it as he can be. There we go. Alan, anything else? No, I think that's it. We'll have to, uh, we'll have to get you back on, uh, with our, yeah. with our partner, uh, site, Nittany sports. Now, now that you're big 10 rivals with, uh, with the, <laughs> the, the lines down the road here, very bizarre, uh, Washington coming to Pennsylvania in November. So, uh, yeah, strange new world. We're all adapting for it. Uh, go check out the content at, at on Mont Lake. I was, I was checking it out, uh, earlier today and man, uh, I've seen some sub stacks and that looks like a pretty well stocked and, and, uh, well designed one. So if you're, uh, I don't know if you're Washington Huskies fan or you just, uh, want to see some good sports writing, go check that out. And thanks Christian so much for joining us. All right. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Yep, all that stuff will be in the description of the show. But again, thanks, Christian, for joining us. Uh, Alan and I will stick around. We're going to talk about the schedule, but we're going to let Christian get out of here. So once again, Christian, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll have to do it again. Thank you. Yep. There we go. Uh, it was Christian Capel. Uh, we will put all his stuff in the description of the show so you guys can find him there. Um, but, Alan, we want to uh, dive into the the schedule a little bit more um schedule was obviously released yesterday and um we haven't really talked about it a lot because we we there was it leaked out but we really couldn't talk about it until it was officially put up by the nfl so yesterday with e-rob we could really only talk about the christmas day game with the chiefs now it's officially been released we know the full schedule where do you even want to start with this thing because i mean there's just so many quirks to it like not having a divisional opponent until week 11 Obviously, starting out on the road back to back isn't like that uh, normal, but three of the first four, four of the first six on the road. There's just so many things about the schedule, man, that like get my mind going. Smitty, I have to say, I am outraged. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. Everyone else was outraged. I. There's nothing wrong with the schedule. It's fine. It's it's the games in the order that they'll be played. We all knew the games. Like the thing about the Steelers' schedule is that they have the hardest schedule in the league, and frankly, they have one of the harder schedules I've seen in a long time. And you knew it was going to be hard. And there's no way to order the games that are there without making it hard. And I honestly think if you're the Pittsburgh Steelers, and you have a new offensive coordinator, two new quarterbacks, three rookies starting in the offense, you'd rather the hard came at the end anyway. Um. There is one part of this schedule that I think is slightly unfair to the Steelers specifically. I will I will let you air your grievances though before I say what I think. Uh, if you if you have a I think there's one valid complaint if you're the Pittsburgh Steelers. Hmm. Okay. Well, I, I'll start with what I enjoy about it. I love the Week Nine buy compared. By the way, I because- I as a forget the wanting your team to win part of it as a fan Mm -hmm. this schedule rocks like i want all the we'll see what's interesting as a fan of the game i want all the important games at the end period like every year i want i want all of the important games for every team to go at the end of the season every year like that that should be the way it always happens i would be fine if we didn't play any division games before december like cool sign me up i got no problem with that so like that part is not going to bother me as a fan of the game. I think that's awesome. No, I, I I'm not bothered by it. I just think it was kind of odd that that is the case this year. They didn't have a divisional opponent until week 11 um, week nine by I like um, I've had conversations with some other season ticket holders. Like we were talking about it today. They're not necessarily fans of, you know, three of the games being in prime time and then one on Christmas being the home games. And by um, not necessarily a fan, you mean like hate with they do not like fiery they, yeah. passion, right? And I get it, man. If I was paying for those tickets, I wouldn't. I wouldn't like that either. Yeah. So they're not they're not fans of that aspect of it. For me, I personally don't care. I don't get a lot of sleep anyway. So whatever Sunday night, Monday well, night doesn't matter to me. Hard. <laughs> we yeah. are used to it. Uh, so I, I'm I'm good with that. Um, but yeah, the person that I buy my tickets off of, like that have the lease, and I buy two of their seats. Uh, is a 65 year old woman and her very elderly father. So like 
this isn't the best schedule for them to be able to attend games um, either. So I don't know. But in terms of like, I'm not, I, I feel like this, I might not be the right person for this because I'm not necessarily all that infuriated by the schedule either. I, I think it's odd. I, I think that's a better word to describe how I feel about it is I was just very surprised by the fact there's not a division game till week 11 um, for the first six on the road. Those are my two big takeaways. And of course, I don't know if this is the part that you were going to talk about, but playing obviously short week Baltimore on Saturday and then turning around playing Christmas against the Chiefs on that Wednesday. Uh, not the biggest fan of that, but he, here's what I don't like about the Steelers schedule. If I was the Steelers, really, there's kind of two things, um, but it's it's mostly one thing. And, and they're both surrounding the Christmas Day game. So it was okay. decided pretty early on. I was talking to the the you know the couple of NFL vice presidents or whatever about the the schedule, and basically what their their process was like. We had to decide pretty early on who the Christmas teams were going to be, because there is no flex scheduling for those. They mm-hmm. have to be the same four teams playing in standalone national windows on consecutive weeks. So it'll be a national game for the Steelers, Ravens, Texans, and Chiefs, both Saturday the 21st and on Christmas Day. Okay, So it has to be teams that you know everyone is going to want to see and you know it now. It can't be like a maybe. Honestly, yeah. And, and so to me, the Steelers don't belong in that group based on their 2023 accomplishments. The Steelers belong in that group in terms of the the audience. Yes, everybody mm-hmm. always wants to see the Steelers. They're one of the largest fan yeah. bases in the league. Uh, they are one of the most consistent revenue-producing teams for the NFL. I feel like the Steelers are being punished for having a large audience compared to their recent success. Like, mm-hmm. the Cowboys are a big market team with a lot of success, not, but they don't play everybody on that list. Okay, so it can't be the Cowboys. The Eagles are a big market team with a lot of recent success. They're not on that list. Okay, like, there are teams 49ers with, safe, with big yeah. audiences that have rec- a lot more recent success than the Pittsburgh Steelers that, that, that are not I, – I, like, if you're the Kansas City Chiefs, you can't cry foul. You should have – Every possible disadvantage that the schedule makers can give a team, the Kansas City Chiefs should be getting it. And they just got to take it because they just won the Super Bowl twice. Like, that that's that's part and parcel of it. And, okay, they have to have opponents, right? And so, look, the Baltimore Ravens won a very difficult division, won a playoff game. Sure, like, they they should be on that short list of teams that, that are getting the worst end of the scheduling stick, right? Houston Texans. Like, hey, I'm sure this is a team that's been complaining for years about their lack of national games. Here you go. Drink Mm -hmm. it through the fire hose, right? You have your one good season. Now you're getting all you can handle. Fine. Uh, I think the Steelers have a little bit of a legitimate complaint being included in that group when really their on-field track is not where those other teams are. And so, uh, and look, it does affect it. Like we talked about with Era yesterday, like you have back to back short weeks at the end of the season. That's impactful. That isn't, that is a, a mm-hmm. and, and then the other part of it is their lead in to this is a road game at the Philadelphia Eagles. Like mm-hmm. of the other teams that are playing. In this scenario, they, they decide, okay, it's going to be Chiefs, it's going to be Steelers, it's going to be, uh, you know, te- Texans, and it's going to be the Baltimore Ravens, okay? So those are the, the four teams that, that, that are doing this. The, here's who everybody else plays in Week 15, okay? Uh, the Texans have Miami, a, a challenging opponent, but it's at home. Uh, the Chiefs are at the Browns, and the Ravens are at the Giants. I think with respect to the Dolphins and Browns, the Steelers have by far the hardest lead in to that two game stretch. Okay. And then look at the other end of it, right? Look, they after that have the Cincinnati Bengals, like to close the, the, the Ravens have the Browns. Like that's not, and so I think the Steelers are the worst of those four teams. They really don't belong along with the three others. And they got the most difficult part around that 
uh, of those four teams. That's the part of it that I think if you want to say this is the Steelers aren't being treated fairly here, I think that's the part of it that resonates for me. Not even something I thought about, but now I am. <laughs> now you're mad. So, so, uh, so you <laughs> again, started I don't know if I'm mad, but... mad. You started out not mad, and now you are mad. That's that's ah. good. That's good. And I'm not mad. I think it's a good schedule for the Steelers in general. I think they should want this kind of schedule that's backloaded, considering their circumstances. Uh, also, travel, extremely yeah. favorable. They only have mm. – I'm flying three times this year. I'll be driving to every other opponent. Uh, they don't leave the Eastern time zone after s- September or October. October 11th is the is the trip mm. to uh, to Las Vegas. They don't leave the Eastern time zone after October. Like, there are a lot of good things about this schedule. Uh, fourth fewest miles traveled. I think there's one pretty significant hiccup there that, that feels like it's, it's a bit, it, the, the one thing I will say about it is, and maybe this is unfair, but I'll like that Kansas city game was going to be a loss no matter where you put it on the schedule. So like, like I mean, like on one hand, that is very difficult part of the stretch of the season. On the other hand, is a game against the Chiefs easy no matter where you put it? No. Are the Steelers probably going to beat the Chiefs no matter when they play? No. So there's no making that part easy. Like, you want to go to Arrowhead and play them? Well, it's a home game. But, like, you want to play them the first week of the season? Like that, you know, like that. That's not yeah, better. That that typically would be their best shot, like, because they wouldn't be clicking on it. But, like, the Steelers, with every all the turnover they've had on the offensive side of the ball, like, yeah, they're going to be the ones that are – you know, trying to third ducks in a row and might be slow out of the gate. So probably not like it's almost, you know, a couple years ago. I know that we've referenced this before, but the Steelers being able to go to Buffalo and beat a better bills team because it was in yeah. week one. And yeah, like, that honestly, would be the case like, to me because the Steelers are the team that have had so much turnover and are trying to, you know, get their ducks in a row. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the Ravens schedule, the Ravens mm-hmm. start, with the Chiefs, they have the Cowboys in week three, Bills and Be- they, then their first five weeks, they have at Chiefs, Raiders, at Cowboys, Bills, at Bengals. That's, I would much rather, if I'm the Steelers, have their loaded end of the season than the Ravens' loaded beginning of the season, right? Mm-hmm. Com- comparing yeah. the way the teams are coming into the season in terms of the relative amount of change they've had, like the Ravens are much better set up. I think the Ravens might win in Arrowhead. Like I, I think that'll be like a like uh, give me the Ravens and the points in that game. Like I, I, I like that idea because they're set up to win right now. The Steelers we don't even know who's playing quarterback. Like come on, like they they got a lot of work to do. I I am actually very hopeful though that. Uh, and again, I don't I don't disagree with anything that you're saying, but I am very hopeful that like the Steelers somehow do beat the Chiefs, uh, because then you know somebody can go and find this video. They're going to clip that, probably tag <laughs> us both, and that would be great. Old Tate exposed uh, on Twitter. Um, but I mean, I'm not yeah, saying they I, will lose. I'm just saying you're not feeling like it's a win, no matter where you put it. Like when you're sitting there putting on your W's and L's, like you're making uh, but, that one way, an L, no matter where you put it in the schedule. Like we gotta we gotta stop we gotta stop doing that by the way like it, it, like overall giving a record prediction that's fine but doing it like game by game it never like that, that's so pointless to me because you're not you can't predict the injuries that are going to take place like we talked about last you know, year I'll, I'll do it on the how, eve of the season and still like 70 percent like that's the best you're gonna do like but, but my point is, look at la- the end of last year where they closed out with Cincinnati, Seattle, Baltimore. How daunting did that look in terms of on and then, paper going and, into and it? And two weeks before, New England and Arizona, and they lose the two, those two, and win the lot. Like, my yeah. point exactly. So, you know, nobody would have, you can't predict Joe Burrow getting hurt. The Ravens obviously just sitting everybody in the finale. You know, there, there's just going to be things that are going to happen throughout the course of a season where. At the end of the day, the total prediction, probably somewhere within the, the realm that you would say, but game by game, that's not going to be the case. Yeah, I haven't even, I, I kind of resist the temptation to even put a prediction in my head at this time of year. I don't hmm. even want to have a thought 
about what a prediction for the season might be until we get a lot more clear picture about who is on everyone's roster. Who's, who's going to play big roles where uh, there's going to be major injuries that happen between now and the start of the season. Like I, I think, and then I think you get, it's hard to, once you've put something out there or even like put something in your own head, you get like attached to it, right? You get stuck with yeah. it. And you, like, so I don't even want to, like, I, I don't even want to have a thought about what I think the Steelers record is going to be yet. I'll, uh, I'll wait. I mean, and we're also, we don't know the steel, not just the Steelers, but everybody. But since we're just talking about the Steelers on here, like their, their roster is not complete. Like I, I, I would be willing to bet that there are going to be changes like at least one somewhat significant one to this roster by now until they kick off. Yeah. So like, how, how can we sit here and make predictions? You said you have to resist the urge to put out a prediction. I have to resist the urge since it's gone to 17 games, not to just immediately go to 10 and seven. That is literally what I always want to say for the, for the Pittsburgh Steelers in a 17 game season. It's, it's not wrong. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Scientifically you're pretty close, right? I mean, that's, uh, it's right about where they've been. Yeah. Yep. Is there anything so we'll else uh, from from the last twenty four hours uh, that you want to touch on? Some Cam Hayward news uh, said that he is mm. not going to be uh, in attendance at OTAs. Uh, to yeah. me, I don't care. It's a non story. Cam Hayward <laughs> is not. I, I I think the reason it's like uh, he's been at OTAs every year prior. Well, right? he's so like, been there, like physically right. there. Yeah, but like mm-hmm. what he does there is not important to whatever like veteran guys that have been on the team as long as cam hayward are accomplishing nothing by going to otas like bottom yeah they don't need the team doesn't need to be there they don't need to be there it's irrelevant and i i said the same thing i the the reason that i could see people running with it though is because like i said it's it's the first time that he will have not been present despite the fact that and i even think that you said this yesterday like they shouldn't want him doing anything at OTAs yeah. anyway. So, what would you have a I, guy who's 35 coming off a groin surgery do, 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 in the same scheme? Where they didn't replace a single player on the entire defensive line depth chart, nor at outside linebacker down to the fourth outside linebacker. Like, who's he need to get time with? Like, that they're, they're all the same guys. The whole front is the same. Like, there, mm-hmm. there's no, there's nothing for him to learn. Uh, so I, you know, I don't, nobody cares if Cam's there or not. The team isn't upset about it at all. And it's all it is, is look, okay. Can't the steel, his, his contract this year is not guaranteed. Okay. The Steelers obviously have built this team with the idea that Cam Hayward's going to be on it. Mm -hmm. A piece of the leverage that he has is the dollar figure attached to this year's contract. And if he goes out there in OTAs and he tears his Achilles lifting a bag or something, then it all goes out the window, right? His whole leverage is gone. And so why would you do that? Why, like, why would you put yourself in a position where you can screw up your own negotiations for what's probably the last contract of your career for something that doesn't matter anyway? No one would do that. And that's literally all it's about. It's about the Steelers put a time frame on negotiations that is artificial. They say they're not going to uh, negotiate during the season. And so to me, in many ways, this is a player's response and say, okay, if you're setting this aside as the exclusive negotiating window, then I'm not going to work while I'm doing it because I could screw it up. Even if he pulls his hamstring. Like, that could screw it up, right? That's going to put it into doubt whether he's going to be ready for the start of the season. And are they going to want to sign? You know, like, there, it, it is an essential part of it if you're a player uh, to try to protect yourself. And and I don't, I don't see – and the other thing I will say about this is we have seen this over the last, what, five or six years? Um, a number of Steelers players have gone down this road of not participating in OTAs. Uh, Deontay Johnson, TJ Watt, Minka Fitzpatrick. Um, I feel like there were more, but maybe those are the only ones that are coming to my mind right now. Um, mm, yeah, I don't know. 
they signed them all. Yeah. Let's say I feel like Highsmith did before his extension. I don't remember seeing him anything. Yeah, I believe before. Highsmith was participating, yeah. but um, yeah, they, they all signed. Like, so you know, clearly this is this is a move to foster a deal, not anything else. And so I, I'm I'm expecting a deal to get done. I, I think it will. I was going to ask if you wanted to. I didn't know if you wanted to I put a prediction out there. Look, even like half injured and obviously not a hundred percent. He was at worst their second best defensive lineman last year. Where's the replacement plan? There isn't one. Like I, he's not going anywhere. Uh, so I guess my bigger question is the the length, more than anything else. Because... I think you can deal with length as long as you don't have a bunch of guaranteed money at the end of it. Okay. Like the like, if they have to, like I put on Twitter like. Turn his sixteen million this year into signing bonus. Give him two million this year and guarantee it in salary. And uh, you know, you spread that sixteen over the three years, and then you, next year you give him like ten with two of it guaranteed, and the following year you give him eight with none of it guaranteed. Uh, you can play with the guarantees, or you can add a roster bonus in there, or whatever. But like some structure like that makes a lot of sense to me for everyone. You know, I do think that while Cam Hayward was right to suggest that it's ridiculous that you take a pay cut this year, two years removed from a Pro Bowl after having one injury in the last half a no, seven years, something like that. Um, that's the other thing, man. Where did this narrative come from that Cam Hayward is injury prone? Like, oh, he's always hurt. I'm like, he got hurt one time. Like, what are we doing? I don't I've heard from so many people, oh, Cam Hayward is always hurt. Cam Hayward played 17 games in 2022, 17 games in 2021, was held out of the last game in 2020, 16 games in 19, 16 games in 18, was held out of the last game in 2017. Since his last injury before last season, he went to six Pro Bowls and was a four-time All-Pro. Like, no, he's not injury pro. You know what's interesting about that is this is now, like, the teams that were playing this, like the NFC East, this was the last time at home. that Like, it was exactly eight years ago. Yes. When he tore his yeah. Peck. yeah. That's how long yeah. it's been. Yeah. Right. Like he is an extremely, whatever the opposite of injury prone is. I don't know that that the prone needs an antonym. He is the opposite. He is sturdy. He's like the, the lead. how many players do you think have played that many games in the NFL over that time? Span? Very few. Like one of the yeah. durable, that's right. One of the most durable players in the league is what we're talking about. Like where I don't understand where this stuff comes from. I swear, like in terms of the perception of some fans, Cam would have been better off shutting it down. Like, I think people would think about him differently if he was just out for the year. Like, I, I mm -hmm. think watching him play at 80% yeah. or whatever he was when he came back has like ruined him in some people's mind. I don't get it. The reaction to – if you're a Steelers fan and you don't want Cam Hayward on this team this year, you're insane. Insane. I, I, I cannot comprehend it. Forget the forget the leader and the person, who I think we all love, but I think we can divorce – we can divorce that when we're talking about sports, right, and, and talk about the business. The business, Pittsburgh Steelers, should beg Cam Hayward to play this year because he is way better than anybody else they got. Like, what I, what are we doing? I mean, I'm just at a total loss with, with this whole. With <laughs> I this certainly whole... know some people that fall yeah. into the bucket that you're talking about uh, from social media, but I definitely want, I, I guess my trepidation is the longer that we go on, like definitely want him on the team this year would definitely think next year. But like, if we're talking like three plus, that's where I get a little bit of where I have a little bit of concern. I don't think three plus, I think two to three or th three. And, and, and the third, if it is three, we'll, we we'll, can't have guaranteed money in it. And I think that's that's fair. Enough. Then then yeah, then I'm on. Then I'm. You don't even have to sell me on anything. I'm good with that. Yeah, I, and like I, Cam is not an unreasonable person. He wants to win a Super Bowl. He's gonna like just because he doesn't want to take a pay cut doesn't mean he has gonna have exorbitant demands. Um, you know, he he understands that he is 35 years old. I'm sure he feels it every day when he wakes up. I know I do. <laughs> uh, you know, he he understands that this is the last one. And that there's not going to be any more after this, and that it's it's the downslope of a of a career. But man, mm -hmm. ah, the, the 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 discourse around that man this offseason has been baffling to me. Baffling. Well, you know, maybe once he gets out onto the field, uh, 
it's you know training camp or whenever that might be and looks healthy that conversation will change but I think that you're right. I think that it's a lot to do with him coming back injured last year and would have been better leaving a question mark in people's minds as opposed to them actually seeing a result. So we will leave it at that. Alan, you know the drill. Tell the people where they can find you. Hey, Saunders underscore PGH, PGH Steelers now, SteelersNow.com. Like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Uh, 12,000 subs on the YouTube channel. Very nice. You got to mention that yesterday, yeah. And uh, thank you so much to Christian Cable. Uh, today's guest make sure you check out his stuff at the Substack on Mont Lake. I'm not kidding or shilling it looks really awesome uh go check it out and also um check out yesterday's episode if you missed it with Landon Roberts uh which was in my eyes one of the best conversations we've ever had on here I really enjoyed it and so if you mm-hmm. missed that one don't don't let it go by in the in the feed right go go back and, and make sure you get to that one I had four different people tell me that their favorite part of it was when he said, you don't see a Landon Roberts at OTAs. And he didn't mean that he wasn't present there. Yeah, He just yeah. isn't him yet because the pads aren't on. Love that. My favorite part of the conversation as well. But yes, be sure to go check that out. Uh, I can actually just put the link to that right in the description of this as well, even though it is just one up, uh, just to make sure you guys don't miss it. Uh, like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Hit that notification bell because then you won't miss anything. So be sure to do that as well. Hit us in the comments with any questions for a future episode, thoughts on anything that we talked about. We want your thoughts on the schedule as well. There's been a, obviously a lot of conversation on X. People are upset. We want to know what your thoughts are on the schedule. Again, big shout out to Chris Campbell for joining Leave us a five-star review and subscribe if you're listening somewhere else, Apple, Spotify, wherever your podcast from. I'm Zachary Smith, PGH. Find me everywhere. For Alan Saunders and myself, thanks for jumping in. Take another ride on the Steelers' afternoon drive. 